Life Science Incubator. We have a lot of scientists here that come and work and do molecular biology, do synthetic biology, and do a lot of other projects upstairs in our lab. We have students that do projects every day. We have companies that are pioneering in new research, and then we do other types of research with the universities. So we're excited to, if you want to spend more time after the event tonight and talk with us. I'm going to introduce David Hirschberg, who is our founder and had this idea of opening up this nonprofit to grow our workforce, grow and educate our community here. So we're excited to have everybody that I see all these faces that come every month. So welcome. 
I had been chit-chatting with David, Dr. Voringer all afternoon, so we're in for a treat tonight. So, Dr. Hirschberg. Hey, thank you guys for all coming tonight. So, uh, uh, I'm, I, I really want, to, I'm, I'm excited about the talk tonight. I have, there's so many people I've seen in the crowd that I'm very excited that they're here. I encourage you to, in addition to ask David a ton of questions afterwards, to just go up and ask some of the people sitting next to you and that, um, about what they do. Um, I am amazed to see some of the people here. So we have all kinds of people, educators, engineers, students, uh, business people. Uh, it's really great to see the community coming together for this. Um, also, just to let you know, we are incubating about four or five companies in the building now, and many of those proprietors are here. So if you want to ask them what they do, uh, find out about what they're doing, invest in their company, buy their products, uh, <laughs> and, and maybe even work in their labs. So, okay, again, thanks for coming. So, uh, so the Superheroes of Science has been formed really, this is part of our public outreach as we do for Girls Who Code and all the other projects we do for students, but really we want to get the community very comfortable with science and, and really just understand kind of things we do in the business of science and how to, how to execute on this. And so talks are technical, but they're accessible to everybody. Um, and then part of this comes from a course that I taught at Critical Thinking where I really wanted to get uh, people I knew in the field. You know, as you get older, you actually become part of history and, uh, <laughs> and you don't just read about it anymore. And so some amazing things are done. And so uh, a lot of my friends, I started inviting up here. And a lot, and everybody comes up to, to talk to us in, in Tacoma and they do it for free because one of them cheap and second, uh, but they really want to do this, and it's it's kind of it's exciting that I can get uh, people to come up and tell their stories, and then, and I think it's great for our community because in other areas of the country these things happen all the time, and so this is what I'm trying to get started here. If you guys know a superhero and you want somebody to come talk, come talk to me, and there's a lot of criteria to be a superhero. You can't just be awesome and. You know, if you know, if you've read a lot of comic books growing up, um, you know the superheroes have to have alter egos, they have to have weak spots, they have to have a little bit of a place where, you know, kryptonite may harm them, things like that. Um, so I won't tell you what David's weaknesses are, <laughs> but I will tell you his strengths. So I know David, since we were doing postdocs together down in Stanford, uh, we struggled. Uh, there were a lot of days we wondered how we were going to make it living on a postdoc salary in the Bay Area where everybody else seemed to be making it and, and the dot-com was going strong and we maybe not gone in the right field because we were in biology. Uh, <laughs> but we used to uh, go to little uh, coffee shops and, and, and plot out what we were gonna do late nights. Uh, David taught me how to build computers and do stuff and, and he was always into the newest things. And so um, I, took the easy route and went to a big company. David started a company from scratch. And I mean, he was, at one time, the R&D guy, the, one of the main R&D guys. He was the sales force, uh, the world sales you know, guy who did it uh, when they were trying to move one unit a year. Uh, <laughs> and so it was amazing to see that. So uh, to see the success of all the things he did and how, where he pulled from, I think is a, is a great story. And so hopefully he's going to share a little bit about this tonight and some of the ideas and, and thoughts he has as he's kind of come through this. Okay, so I'm going to turn it over to David Borager. <laughs> Thank you. I want to meet that guy too. <laughs> um, it, it, when David asked me to come up here and talk, I said, well, what's the audience and everything? And I'm used to, you know, going around to biotech companies and and you know, real technical, deep discussions and everything. And more recently, I've actually been asked a couple different times. Uh, last year, I was, uh, I had the amazing fortune of being um, uh, awarded the, the Distinguished Alumni for the Texas Medical Center last year. And they asked me to come give a talk to the graduating class of uh, graduate students and MDs and everything and talk about my experience. And so, more recently, I've been kind of thinking about those types of things. And, 
The presentation I put together today shares a little bit of that. There is some technical aspects of it, but um, I hope, uh, it looks like there's a very broad audience here. I hope you guys, everybody can find a little something in it that, that may be useful. And, and of course, uh, stop me if there's any more detail you want me to go into. The thing that amazes me about all of this is the stories behind all of this. This, and just in being at rain today, this is the first time I've been here, um, the feeling I really get, and I love the stories of the early uh, uh, computer technology boom and, and Silicon Valley and everything where, you know, a variety of disparate people would get together that had common interests and things like that and talk about these types of things. And, and from that grew incredible technologies, incredible businesses and everything. And, you know, driving through Tacoma, I, I tell you, I got the sense, I'm like, wow, this is kind of a neat place. Now, I'm sure, I think there is a, a, a backlash against Californians moving to uh, 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 this Washington area and everything. So I don't know, maybe I can get some insight with some of you guys about uh, doing it, but it's definitely beautiful here. Um, what I'm gonna talk about today is kind of the arc of my life. And, you know, David's you know, hit the high points about how we, I got to do all these different things. And, and you know, by a certain metric, you'd say he was very successful. But along that road of success, all I did was fail all the time. And um, what I want to talk about today is kind of how I learned, and, 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 and maybe this can help some of you as you move through some of these process, these different stages of, of a company's development, how to kind of look at things and, and take a step back. And I came across this, this, this talk, or this, this uh, parable of the Chinese farmer. Has anybody heard this? Because I had never heard it, and it's, it's actually really good. Anybody heard of the Chinese farmer? Okay, so, great. So the story of the Chinese farmer is that um, he's a, a, an old, old gentleman, he's got a young, he has a son, and he has a small farm, he's got a single horse and everything, and he's out farming one day, and his horse runs away. And he, he subsists on uh, the production of his farm, and the horse pulled the plow and everything. So the villagers all come to the, Chinese farmer and they say, well, oh my God, this is, this is terrible. You've lost your horse and you know, what's gonna happen? How do you, this is just terrible. And the, the farmer said, well, we'll see. And so a couple of days, uh, the next day goes by and the Chinese farmer's walking out in this field, you know, what am I gonna do now? And his horse comes back and his horse has 10 other wild horses following them. And, and, and the neighbors see all this and everything. And the neighbors come running over to the, the Chinese farmer and they go, oh my God, what good fortune. Look at, you know, you have all these horses now, you can get all this work done, you must be so happy. And he said, we'll see. And so he has, this, he has the son, right? And the son uh, is saying, well, we're gonna put these horses to work and everything. And so I'm gonna go train these horses, break them so we can use them. Uh, for the farm and he's on the horses and everything and he's, he's breaking one of the horses and it's a really wild steed and it throws him off and the, 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 the kid breaks his leg. And the villagers hear about this and they come to the Chinese farm and they go, we are so sorry, you know, we know you're old and can't work in the field and that your, your son has broken his leg now, this is just terrible news. And, and the Chinese farmer says, we'll see. Um, and then the next day, uh, this is China, there was a war going on, and the conscription officer comes to the town. And he comes around and he's knocking on all the doors and he's asking for all the young men to come out and everything. And he goes to the Chinese farmer and he says, oh, you know, I heard you have a son, we, we need uh, fodder for the, the battles and everything. And, and the son is unable to uh, move because of the broken leg. And they say, well, we won't take him and everything. And the villagers come to the, the man and says, well, this is amazing. Um, your son doesn't have to go off to war, he'll be, he'll, he'll live, and, and what do you think? And he says, well, we'll see. And the, the point of this story is that nature is very complex and it's always changing, and, it, and our perception of what is successful, what is failure, and what is good and what is bad, it evolves as we evolve through life. And so, um, you know, we get caught up in what we're doing and we get so focused on what we're doing, sometimes we miss the bigger picture where there are opportunities in a situation where things aren't going the way that we hope they go. And uh, so I've tried to learn to say, we'll see a lot more uh, in life. Um, because there are 
uh, a lot of down things. Um, and so let me step you through the three phases of, of, of the talk. And I'll, I'll briefly touch on graduate school, then the postgraduate training, and then industry, and, and then talk to you a little bit about the technology. And so um, to kind of set the, the tone of where David and I were when we entered graduate school, this is the halcyon days in the 1990s. And, and we were at the peak of fashion. We were in much, I was in much better shape. David's still in great shape. And, and, and the gals were uh, fashion plates and everything. Um, and you know, instead of uh, uh, playing the social life, David and I decided to pursue the sciences. And the area that I went into, so I went to MD Anderson uh, Cancer Center in Houston. And um, what was becoming popular at the time, or what was kind of this new revolution, was this understanding that um, we all understood mitosis. I mean, we all learned that in uh, you know, maybe middle school biology or at least high school biology, and then for those of us in, in college, we understood how a cell divided. But what we didn't appreciate was that very similarly, there's a flip side of that coin where cells will die. And so that's called apoptosis, programmed cell death. And it's a very controlled and regulated process. And we were the first uh, uh, research lab in the country that got a, 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 a grant from the US government to study apoptosis because in, in cancer, there's kind of three treatments at the time. It was you could either burn cancer out with radiation, you could cut it out as a surgeon, or you could poison it out as a chemotherapy doctor. And we were in experimental radiation oncology, and so we would irradiate what were normal round-looking you know, the cells look normal, they get round, and you irradiate them, and this is a scanning electron micrograph of the cell kind of collapsing down on itself, eating itself, and breaking apart. And um, we were really interested in studying this, and so what I spent my eight years of graduate school doing was when we started, nobody had any models for it, nobody had any systems to study it, and, I developed a number of models that you could do molecular biology type things on. We could study all the enzymes that got activated. We could play around with uh, transfecting genes in or knocking genes out and at looking at how the mechanisms of everything worked. And one of the ones that we stumbled across was, this is kind of fast forwarding uh, after this part of the story I'm about to tell you, a molecule that became uh, a molecule of the year. and. Um, this is, I mean, it's still a very important molecule. A lot of people work and study P53. When, when we met P53, P53 had, uh, people thought it was involved in senescence. They thought it was involved in cells uh, going into a stasis state where they wouldn't divide anymore. They didn't think anything about how it maybe regulated uh, 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 other types of processes. And we were fortunate enough to go to a talk at Baylor College of Medicine where they had made the first transgenic mice where they knocked out P53. They were going to study its role of senescence in these mice. And me and my mentor at MD Anderson, Ray Mayan, and a really great radiation biologist, we looked at each other halfway through the talk and we said, it'd be great if we could borrow some of their mice, well, borrow some of their mice and irradiate them. I guess we wouldn't be giving them back. But, um, and, and see what happens. And so um, we went up to Larry Donahauer who had made these mice and and said, you know, we're begging because everybody was wanting to study these for all their different things. Nobody was really interested in the apoptosis part, so we wanted to irradiate them. And lo and behold, there's, there's moments in science when you do an experiment and the result is so uh, profound and clear that it, it, it doesn't need any nuance, I mean, it doesn't need any manipulative interpretation. It's just obvious what happened. And so with the uh, P53 mice, when you irradiated a P53 mouse, uh, a normal mouse, its thymus within four hours disappeared. So a thymus are these uh, immune cells, thymocytes that are acutely sensitive, that they're ready to go into apoptosis. So a little bit of radiation and the thymus gets wiped out. It's other organs and other tissues of your body do the same thing and that's why when people get radiotherapy, you know, the hair falls out or their gut lining, they have problems and things like that. Uh, we were studying it in an organ that all the cells did this. And so you take a normal mouse, you radiate it, you look at it four hours later, there's no thymus left. And what was interesting in the P53 mice, if you irradiate them, four hours later, you, you cut them out, you look, and then you, then you start asking yourself, well, wait a minute, do we irradiate them? Is this the one we irradiated or not? And you start, because nothing changes. And so fundamentally what we realized was that P53 was involved in radiation-induced apoptosis. We did a couple of other experiments. It was this big player in DNA uh, repair and, and apoptosis. And so where am I going with all this? Well. 
all of this molecule of the year and the five or six careers for David Lane and all these other really famous, world famous scientists now that run these huge institutes, they got famous doing the exact experiments that we did. But they were probably a week ahead of us in doing the experiments. And so at the time we did the experiments, we saw this, it was, uh, I can't describe the, the euphoria and the excitement of that feeling where it's, it's really what a scientist goes into science for, which is to, to peer through a microscope or to look at something and realize, oh my God, nobody else in the world knows this. And this is profound. And so you just you get chills and you get so excited you want to tell everybody. And so we wrote the papers up and we, uh, you know, to be published in Nature or Cell or Science, that's kind of the, you know, the big, that makes your career. And if you do it as a graduate student, you know, you write your ticket on whatever you want to do. And uh, so we submitted our papers to, to science. And um, right when we submitted, we submitted our papers, it started to go into review, and the reviewers came back and said, we've already accepted a paper that uh, shows the exact same thing from the head of the university, I mean, from, from Cambridge University, the head of the UK Cancer Research Program, David Lay, I mean, all these world-class famous scientists. And we saw the paper, and the freaking figures were exactly the same. The results were the exact same results that we had. So you, you can see it's actually, it bothers me a little bit because I'm going into <laughs> way too much detail. I'm, I'm kind of cognizant of time. Um, so I let go. That's actually my, my point here in a second. Um, I, was, I was heartbroken. And I'll tell you the positive out of this in a second. Um, so I'm giving this talk to GSBS, is the graduate school in Houston, so this is the talk I gave them, and I you know, like, went through that whole story. Um, I didn't tell you about the self-sabotage, I was talking to some other people earlier about it. In this phase of my life, I was really afraid of success, and so a lot of times I would sabotage myself, and it's something I continue to have to watch to do. And so as you're working through these things, when you're down, that's an easy time to figure out that I don't want to do this, I'm done. And you have to maintain that positive attitude. And, and keep going and, and learn to accept help from others. Um, we had this P53 experiment. It was almost the home run. I mean, I was starting to count the chickens of, you know, I'll, I'll go to Harvard and then I'll do this and they'll name this institute after me. And, um, and so the thing I learned from that is I had that euphoric moment. I've had it two or three times in the 30 years of science, that euphoria of the purity of seeing a discovery. And it is undescribable. It's better than the best drug. I haven't tried the best drugs. I heard they're really good, but this is pretty amazing. And um, you need to live in the moment and not always be comparing yourself to other people. Don't always look over and see, you know, how much more money do they have? How much more funding do they have? That's all important to some extent, but judge yourself on, on what you're doing and be fine with that. Um, and as you said, the chips on your shoulder, and this will be a reoccurring theme, uh, th those can get heavy. The, the last thing about MD Anderson, and this goes back to what I was going to tell you about the P53 paper, was I had been at MD Anderson for eight years. I'd seen it grow from a mom and pop cancer center to be the Disneyland of cancer. I knew everybody there. I participated in all these things. I was, you know, won all these awards from them. And I was expecting them to say, hey, you know, why don't you be an assistant professor here and everything? And they said, nope, they didn't even, you got to go. And, and so I came across that first time in life when you realized that change is scary as heck because here I'd established myself, I thought I was, this is where I was gonna spend my career, and instead they pushed me out into the cold, cruel world, um, and how was I gonna deal with that? Well, I was gonna deal with it because when we submitted that paper that I told you about to science, science, when you submit a paper, they send it to reviewers to, re to read the paper. And the reviewers for this paper uh, was Len Hertzenberg at Stanford. And Len is a, a real famous scientist. He was a step short of the Nobel. He won the, uh, what's the Japanese one? The, the Wolf Award, the Kyoto Prize, the Japanese Nobel. Uh, he invented what's called the flow cytometer. And uh, they were instrumental in early days of immunology. They did all the, what's hot right now is, is antibody therapeutics. They're the ones who brought antibody technology to the US from the French labs. They patented all the humanized monoclonals and the drug conjugates. Before Sun Microsystems, the Hertzberg Lab was the largest revenue generator for Stanford University. Um, and it was all through these uh, small little inventions that they made that they patented along the way that 20 years later, 15, 20 years later, became so important for what a lot of us are doing now with immuno-oncology and things like that. 
Len was the reviewer on the paper, and he said, ah, sorry, kid, you didn't get your paper published. But what you did is pretty cool, and the fact that you're a graduate student did all this work is, I'm pretty impressed. Why don't you come out and interview? And so I went out to Stanford, uh, stopped by Tahoe on the way out there, and I rode my bike from Texas to California. I didn't, didn't really. But this is, that is actually me. So you can see I was a lot better shape back then. Um, but uh, California was beautiful. We love California. My wife said we'll never leave. That'll come back up in a second. Um, and so at Stanford, I met David. And we'll hear more about David in a minute. But quickly, the things I learned there is you know, the importance of publishing. We published every year. You always need to be reporting what you're doing. Um, and you know, even in the entrepreneurial space, you're talking to people because you never know where you're gonna get that unique insight. The unique insight always comes from a place you never expect to get it from. Um, you, you, you think you know who's gonna tell you what, you what you need to hear, but they're usually thinking the same way you're thinking. And what you wanna find is people that aren't thinking the way you're thinking. And so um, I get that a lot of people are real apprehensive of sharing your ideas because they feel that somebody else will steal them. But at this stage, they're your ideas. And if you're passionate about it, you're gonna run with that idea and you're gonna be able to run faster than anybody else. Um, the other thing I learned there, this is, this is from your boss, was to surf, which is that whenever new technologies come out, be the expert on the new technologies as quickly as possible. As, as the trends come, it's always easier to make waves when things are new than as opposed to when they become established and everybody else in the world is doing the same thing. Then you become uh, a, a big, small fish in a, in a big pond. And so uh, ride the waves, and what David and I did, the reason I put it in here, David and I got into microarray work, which was just in its infancy at, at Stanford at the time. Um, and uh, just a side note, we bet her whole career on one experiment one day. We, we went and did an affymetrics experiment. The affymetrics are these chips that allow you to measure the RNA expression after something happens. And so I showed you those cells that underwent apoptosis. We also had a daughter cell line that came from the original cells that underwent apoptosis that had become resistant. And so that would be a real fundamental thing to understand. You know, some people you irradiate with radiotherapy and their tumor goes away, that's great. Other people will irradiate the same, same classified tumor and the tumor keeps growing during therapy. So what's, what's the difference there? And so we had kind of made this cellular model to, to kind of address some of the beginnings of that. And we wanted to look at the expression analysis because otherwise we were doing it one gene at a time saying, does this gene make a difference? Does this, uh, we would still be doing it. Um, and David and I did this experiment, and I think at the time those chips were $20,000 a chip, and I think we used 20 or 40 chips, and somebody pointed out to us that if we pipetted wrong, we would never be let into the lab again, because I think two postdocs blew like half a million dollars worth of chips in one day. Um, fortunately, I let David do all the pipetting, and he's a real good pipetter. I, I was the idea man, and he was the, he was the, he was the talent. Um, he performs very well. Um, the, things I, the other things I learned, and this is for people, I don't know that, what students are out here. Um, all of us that were students, as we go through school, we're trained by professors, and, and, and so in a way we gravitate to wanting to become professors. And so we all come out of school thinking, well, I'm gonna become, a, I'm gonna become this great professor. The thing I learned at Stanford is, and then the thing that made Stanford awesome was everybody was trying to take their idea and apply it in the world. And um, so watching people being able to do that was, what, it, it is really amazing. And along those lines, applying it into the world, what so many of us, like I came and got a PhD in cancer biology, I was gonna cure cancer. All of my classmates, we were all gonna cure cancer. And while that's a noble goal, it's probably unrealistic uh, statistically where each of us isn't gonna cure cancer. Um, and you miss a bigger opportunity, which is that uh, you, you could try to cure cancer. I could have spent the last 30, 40 years of my life working on that, and maybe I would have been successful, or maybe I could have moved the bar a little bit further. But when I went to work for Len Hertzberg, the thing I learned was Len was all about, I want to make tools for people that are going to be working along this. It goes back to the old uh, story about the California gold rush. The people that got wealthy during the California gold rush weren't necessarily the people who were getting the gold. I mean, there were one or two of them that would find the big nugget and retire. But for the vast majority of them, they're all poor. The people who made money during the gold rush were the people that were, as they were coming off the stagecoaches, were selling a pick and a shovel and a, and a sifter pan and everything. And so 
Len was that kind of person in his generation. He'd invented the flow cytometer, he invented all these techniques and a lot of the early genetic work, molecular biology, and so it opened my eyes that I didn't have to cure cancer to make an impact in life. I could develop a tool or, or something and actually I could have, probably have a bigger impact if I could sell that tool to a thousand scientists. That's, I gotta, it's like kind of leveraging my knowledge because now they're doing the work for me and everything. So what, as you're thinking about what you want to do and how you want to develop it and everything, consider that of, 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 of helping at that level sometimes is actually more powerful than going for that final goal, the final uh, win. And lastly, uh, this is the big argument I have with the kids because they're, they're, they, they, still, they still have their heart in them and they still are empathetic is that they, uh, they want to do the science and it, they hear about sales and sales is associated with profit, profit is associated with greed and greed is associated, and I know the whole Gordon Gecko thing and whatever. Um, I'm not going to say that. But profit is important because it drives all this stuff. And, um, and I, for myself, at least to sleep at night, the way I figured it out was that I do sales, and so right now in the company I'm at, the company we started, I'm, uh, I ran the sales team for a while, I've kind of now moved on to kind of a merits position and I just control a territory, the uh, Bay Area where Genentech and all that stuff is and I do all special stuff. But I realized that I've been doing sales ever since I started in graduate school. You're selling your ideas to your, uh, your boss when you're a graduate student or maybe the department head if you want to go travel somewhere, you got to sell your idea to him. And uh, then you, you're postdoc and you're selling your ideas to granting agencies to do all that. And you sell through your whole life. And so I was able to put those two together and realize that I actually wanted to be a really good salesman because whether I stayed in academia or went into industry, part of my success was going to be whether somebody would give me money or not. And the only way people will give you money is if they understand what you're trying to do and uh, feel the passion and enthusiasm you have. That was one of the things in talking to the folks around here last night and today, everybody's so enthusiastic. And so, I mean, I, I see great things happening here. Uh, there's a lot of energy and that, I, I never felt that I was energetic, but people would always say, oh, the way you talked about the technology was so exciting and you can tell you're really passionate about it. That's what you want to have because evidently it worked in at least my case, maybe it was dumb luck. Um, kind of skip over the Stanford failures other than I, I said something about it wasn't a home run. I think maybe David and I thought that we were gonna Again, have institutes named after us. See, this isn't even named after you. It's just, it's just rain. <laughs> so you still are failing. <laughs> so, um, we, I think we get, it's those things in your life, right? You have these successes, you get a little high on the horse, and then life knocks you back down. We had these great experiments, we published a paper, we got a lot of attention, we get all these little postcards of all over the world of people wanting us to send them their manuscripts. We had stacks of them. And we thought, this is it, our careers are set, and no, they weren't. And so, uh, uh, so, and you gotta be able to shake that chip off your shoulder and move on. Um, and again, just like MD Anderson, we, uh, we were like, all right, well, but at least we'll get positions here at Stanford and get to stay in beautiful California, and, and that doesn't happen either. And so, this is where Dave and I parted ways. We, we, we had a great run for a couple years and everything. We still stayed in contact, but Dave and went and took a position at Agilent. And um, I moved into industry. And uh, real quickly, the things I learned in industry is, is we'll come back and tell the industry story. I learned that sometimes you're the Indian, sometimes you're the chief. I learned about leadership and I learned about change being good. So we talked about the fear of change. So as I was finishing up at Stanford and David went off to Agile and I was offered an assistant professorship at Wake Forest and we went to the extent of my wife and I flying out to look at the houses and, you know, even though it was a $40,000 salary, $40,000 in Winston-Salem is a heck of a lot more than, you know, $150,000 does in the Bay Area. Um, and so we were really considering, but my wife loved California, and there was a company called Sujin that I was able to get a job at. And I don't know if anybody's heard of Sujin, but Sujin, what their claim to fame was, this is a map of the human kinome, so it's all the kinases in the, in the, in the body. And um, there was, uh, there has been and there is one of the big, biggest selling drugs right now are these kinase inhibitors, being able to block signaling in a cell and obviously in cancer and in other diseases, if you could modulate the signaling, kind of like flipping the light switches on and off in a circuit, um, you can control the outcome and the, the pathology. 
And so Sujin's idea was, well, we'll map all of these, and once we have them all mapped, we're going to drug them all, and then all these drug companies can come and buy our inhibitors, and they can regulate uh, uh, signal transduction. It's not that simple, obviously, in the end it proved to be. But one of the compounds they found was this drug called Sutin. And, and the week after I joined the company, while I'm still going through orientation and everything, they had something which was called an all-hands meeting. So any of you that have big and big companies know this, but those that haven't, all-hands meetings, you better go to them because they, they can be uh, good and they can be bad. And, and in this case, the all-hands meeting was to announce that Sujin had just been bought by Pfizer. And so that's where I learned that the big fish eat the little fish to get the technology to raise their stock price and everything. And um, Pfizer bought uh, Sujin, you see the Pfizer logo there, but it's, they call it Sujin. I actually went down to Pfizer in La Jolla uh, like 10 years later uh, with the company I'm at now with the technology. And I was looking at the history of Pfizer and they, they showed some old guy in the wagon train, and Pfizer drug number one, and they go through the whole timeline and they go through the 90s and 2000s and then they said, and Pfizer invented Sutin. And I was yelling at the receptionist there, going, wait a minute, Pfizer didn't invent <laughs> Sutin. They, they bought the company that invented it, and I lost my job because of it. <laughs> um, so I was the last person hired in this company, and um, I thought, what a stupid mistake I've made by going into the industry. This is, this is as cutthroat as everybody tells you it is. There's no stability in it. It's dog eat dog world out here. I just want to go back to that ivory tower in academia and, and make $10,000 a year. I'll be happy. Um, so again, my wife didn't want to leave California though. And so fortunately there was one guy in the company that had heard about this opening down in Redwood City, a small company that was going to get started. I heard about the idea, I said whatever, it doesn't sound all that, it's okay, but I need something to pay rent next month. And so um, the company ended up being called Cell Bioscience. You probably can't see it in this photo, but this is, uh, this is from Science Magazine, did an article about uh, biotechnology in Silicon Valley. And somehow they ended up using me as a poster boy. Um, I even made my own badge. This is like I made this the day before, printed it all out. And this lab coat, that says, I think the lab coat says Rhonda on it. <laughs> and that's in Science Magazine. So I finally got published in Science. <laughs> Um, we call it the technology case, and then, uh, I'm not going to tell you how it worked, but if you want to stay around afterwards, I can tell you why it was a terrible idea. They had raised $2 million over the year prior to me joining. There was one, the person raising the money and the, the scientific founders. They raised $2 million, um, and, but they had no scientist involved in the raising of the money and any of this stuff. Um, and the work had been done at UC Irvine, and we're down from the Bay Area. So they hired this first team, and I was the first, me and the guy from Sujin were the first two biologist, and so the first thing we had to do was to replicate what had been published in the paper and what had gotten them into $2 million, and I went in there to replicate it, couldn't get it done, repeated it, couldn't get it done, repeated it, couldn't get it done, and you just go on and on, you start getting that queasy feeling, and you're like, oh no, what's going on? And um, I went down, they said, well, why don't you fly down to UC Irvine and watch the founders do the experiment? So I went down there, and these were people, that, after I got down there, realized had never actually done science, um, they were more theoretical folks, and uh, um, what they were doing was they were ordering cells from ATCC because they wanted to they wanted to measure uh, cell signaling in a single cell. They wanted to be able to measure all those signaling nodes in one cell to see how they were activated. And we were putting peptides in the cell, and they were all addressable, all the different kinases, and they'd move through a capillary column with different mobility if they're phosphorylated or not. So we'd be able to tell you on a cell by cell basis how activated all the different kinases were. It was, it was a pie in the sky idea. And I go down there and I'm watching how they do this and they, well we went to ATCC and we ordered the cells and they unscrewed the cap and they kind of warm it up with the fingers and they poured the tube. And then they said, then we put the peptides in and they dropped the peptides into the tube that they just poured the thought out cells into. And they swirl it around. It, these are auto-loading peptides, let me tell you. Um, and it's like, auto, well, what is, how does that, oh they got a leader sequence and it takes them, okay, whatever. Um, and then we put them under the microscope and we lice them, but we put them through the CE and they get the signal. And I'm like, God, this, this, you get that pit in your stomach feeling like these people don't know what they're doing. And um, it still took us another three to four weeks to figure out exactly what's happening. But on the cell surface, there's something called exopeptidases. So these are enzymes that sit on the surface of the cell. And cells don't like peptides floating around them because 
It's all about, life is all about protecting the DNA and, and passing the DNA on to the next cell. And so as the peptides come closer, the exopeptidases start clipping them all up and they will bring in little small little pieces to use that to build things, some amino acid synthesis and stuff like that, uh, prote pro protein synthesis. Um, and what the founders were measuring was that when you put these quote unquote auto-loading peptides into the culture, what they were doing is they were getting clipped by the exopeptidases and that was causing all the shifting that they had interpreted as uh, signaling. And so we had called the technology uh, Cellular activity by capillary electrophoresis, I forget what the acronym stands for, but it actually was caca. It, it didn't work. <laughs> and so, I don't want to run out of time. Mm, close, but this is the most important piece of information I'm going to tell you guys. So the, the secret of the success, how do you sell your company at $330 million and all that stuff? I'll tell you how not to get rich doing that later, but that's also the trip on the shoulder. But um, the secret of the success was that when we figured this out, it, it, timing kind of worked too, is if you're gonna tell the, the venture capitalist that the $2 million they gave you was uh, for a bad idea, tell them like at late spring, early summer. Because most of them are like, they, they're gonna go to the south of France or they have their yacht in the South Pacific in Tahiti and they're gonna go on their vacations. And the last thing they wanna do during vacation time is deal with taking apart a company. And they'll tell you step, step number two, they'll tell you something that's important, which is actually true. You're, you're cynical when they tell you this, but it's actually true. They said, look, all right, it didn't work. This isn't the first time this has happened to us. We invest in the people, in the team, not in the idea. We were like, hmm, okay. Glad you thought that highly of us and everything. The, 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 the founder of our company, the financial founder, which actually nobody knows, you people will know, but nobody even in our company knows this, because uh, it's been lost to history and he's passed away. But it was a guy named Jim Schlater. Jim Schlater, probably nobody knows, maybe a few people know, but Jim, he was on the cover of Forbes magazine with uh, David White and Mike Hunkerpiller. Mike Hunkerpiller's company, Pack Bio, was sold recently. But they founded a company called Applied Biosystems. And Applied Biosystems went from a small little startup to this company that basically helped sequence the human genome and everything. And so that was Jim's first company. He said, oh, that was pretty easy. And then he, they said, you know what, I'm gonna start another company. So then he goes and starts another company, and they said, well, we have this thing where people are taking image, they're imaging stuff with, with Kodak cameras. Kodak's not even making film. We'll make something that they can digitally image their stuff. And so they made something called a phosphor imager, which allows you to collect digital images and typhoons and storms, and they sold that to GE for tons of money too. So his third company says, look, I want to invest in these guys. And he invested in this terrible idea. I don't know why. Oh, well, he invested in the team, I forgot. It wasn't the idea. Um, he invested in the team, and we told him it was a bad idea. And he told us the story of their first sequencer. Um, they put it on the truck to ship to the first customer, and somebody came running out of the back in the loading box and said, wait, 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 wait. The, none of the data, it doesn't work. They had, they had like misled themselves into believing that a lot of the, it was really consistent and accurate. Somebody had done one of these, and you always worry about this in the early days of your company, the uh-oh moment. Because you had your fingers crossed that the proof of concept is gonna work, and um, you try so hard to see it work that you're always afraid that you're gonna prove yourself that it doesn't work. And so um, somebody had done this with ABI, proved that it didn't work, and they had to go back, and it took them another year before they actually launched the first sequencer, but ultimately it worked. Jim told us that story, he said, go, go develop a technology and make it cool. And so, as the scientists, we, I was the, there was two scientists, and the rest of them were all the engineers that had invented all these technologies that kept uh, cycling through with Jim's companies. And I said, look, here's one of the problems. Uh, this is a more recent number, but I said, most of the stuff that gets published is actually wrong or not accurate or not even close. Um, and so this 50% and $28 billion, anybody who want to hazard a guess, I already flipped to the slide, but anybody who has to guess what this is, this was a, a study that was done um, by some of the think tanks in DC and Boston looking at the economic costs of irreproducible research. And so these are experiments that are done that somebody publishes on and then the next person down the line tries to reproduce and they can't reproduce it. And this has concrete effects and I've talked to the VP of Novartis and I had a huge discussion on this. He's like, look, 
we have all these great candidates to try to talk to somebody else about this today. And when we're in the model systems, they work great. When we move into the animal systems with the xenographs, they work okay. And then when we move into the humans, they don't work at all anymore. And what causes that? And there's a lot, it's multifactorial, but part of it is what, what are the types of tools that you're doing using to evaluate? And one of the things that we realized is that some of that evaluation that's being done there's, there's three molecules that the Holy Trinity of molecular biology, DNA, and RNA, and protein. A lot of the work is done on protein, and these are the tools that we use to do this on. And for anybody who's done a Western blot that's familiar with these, this is the same set of tools that you would have done a Western blot in 1978. So from 1978 till today, the technique is still the same. Nobody really changed it. And so, um, when I started graduate school DNA sequencing, the plan was to just let a bunch of graduate students in and give each one of them a piece of the sequence of the genome, and that was your PhD. You sequence that piece of the sequence, and you graduate. And then somebody came up with an automated sequencer, and they said, oh, we don't have to do that, we'll just automate it and sequence it, and everybody got to go back to do regular graduate work. Um, so in the old days, DNA sequencing was slab gels artisan technique. They made built machines, robots, to do an automated sequencing. Next level up the tree, DNA goes to RNA, we used to do northern blots. It would take you a week to do a northern blot and you could look at one RNA message. And then all of a sudden these microarrays came out and you could look at 20,000 features and we could do 20 chips at a time and risk our careers, but it was really cool. And then you move up one more level and, and we all want to measure, the, I would argue, we all want to measure at the protein level because what is disease? The disease, for the most part, there are obviously exceptions, but the most part is dysfunctional proteins in the form of enzymes and things like that that are acting apparently. And so if you're gonna have a drug that inhibits the activity of a kinase or something like that, you need to be measuring at the, at the functional site of where that's taking place and that's at the protein level. And the tools that, one of the tools that we use to measure proteins, the most ubiquitous tool, the Western blot, is done with 1970s technology. And so we sat around a room, uh, eight of us, and said, all right, well, that was a bad idea, what do we do? And I said, I came in with an issue of JVC. This is another trick if any of you need this. But uh, I took an issue of JVC and put yellow sticky notes on every page that had a Western blot on it and held it up to them and said, these are all the Western blots that were done this last month um, by hand. And you guys helped invent the first sequencers and you helped with the, the, the northern blot readers and everything. Let's uh, automate the Western blot. I'll pass this around. and. This is so a Western blot. I don't know if any has anybody done a Western blot. Does anybody know what a Western blot is? So we have a few. Western blots, as you saw in those pictures, are these gels, and you're pouring gels and acrylamides and neurotoxin, and you're dealing with all this stuff that's really not good for you, um, and it wastes a lot of stuff and it's terrible for the environment. And the great thing, this so this here's another tip. The great thing was our engineers didn't have a clue what a, North, a Western blot was. They were DNA sequencing guys. And so I had to spend the first month of this uh, three-month period, we had to uh, reboot the company, sh teaching them how to do a Western blot to show them what the problem was. And as they went through this, they were like, oh my God, this is horrendous. How? You gotta be kidding me that you guys do this. And um, they are like, oh, well, we can just, I'll do it in capillary. So there's three steps to a Western blot. What you have, whether you're looking at, uh, uh, you know, serum coming from your, your blood and you're looking for a biomarker or you're looking at cells that are from a biopsy and you're looking for an oncoid protein or whatever, you have a complex mixture of proteins. And so what you want to do is you want to separate those out in a way that you can then specifically look at the protein you're interested in measuring. And so that separation is done through electrophoresis. So the first step of a Western blot is separation. The second step is that you have to then <coughs> move that protein onto something that becomes a solid phase support, something that sticks it in place so that you can then wash and do other things to it. And so in a traditional Western blot, that's called a transfer. You transfer it out of the electrophoretic gel onto a, a membrane, um, and it sticks to that membrane. And then the last step is you do an immunodetection. You have this, this array of all the proteins in that sample. You want to know how much of my specific protein is in there, and so you use an antibody that floats around until it recognizes your protein of interest and sticks to it. And that was the old way of doing it. We did it all by hand. Um, and the, our guy said, well, we can do this all in capillaries and we can you, you know, save you a thousandth the volume of size and we can do it on single cells. All these technical things that we can do that are really cool. And lo and behold, I, I stay around later for people that are really interested in the technical aspects of this. 
we came up with what is called the simple Western. Um, and so people just walk up to these instruments, kind of washed out here, they bring a plate of their sample. Uh, you're, you're handling the capillaries, which is another format where it's a 25 clip of those capillaries. And so they just pipe out their samples in and the antibodies for the protein they want to look at, they put it in the instrument, they walk away and three hours later, they have an analytical result. The old way of doing it went overnight and you had a semi-quantitative result at best that your, your reproducibility was about 30% variation. So not very precise for doing AI and, and quantum computing modeling on, with 30% errors. Um, and so this is kind of what some of the data looks like. This is, you can see the protein has been separated along the length of the capillary and you can see these dots of light. This is where the antibody is bound and is emitting light. And a uh, high sensitivity CCD camera captures that image. Nobody ever looks at this one because it's meaningless. This is kind of the way we used to look at these blocks was, you know, we look at them in, as film, but this is kind of meaningless too and our eyes are really bad at grayscale detection. And so even though I hated looking at this this way because it looks like HPLC and I was always scared of HPLC, um, this is the best way to look at it because this is all the same data. It's just presented different ways. And here you can see that, well, this peak area is about half of that. And, and you can start doing much more analytical, analytical analyses and to the extent that um, you can start being quantitative. And so this is something that, this is again, uh, when you start with your technology, you think you know what the, it's gonna sell for. We didn't appreciate what it was gonna sell for. We th I thought, because I, I was still poor at the time, I've, I've always been kind of poor, I'm a little bit less poor now, but um, we thought, because I told you it took overnight, it took 24 hours to do a, a Western blot, and now you can do it in three hours, and really it only took about 10 minutes to pipe all that stuff in, and you're done. So you live in La Jolla, you pipe it in for 10 minutes, you go surfing the whole afternoon, you come back and you analyze your data. I mean, it's the perfect life. And so I thought to sell to the market, it was all about automation. Like, look, this automates your data and everything, that's great. And then I realized how cheap labor is in the graduate schools, and they don't really care about labor costs and automation and everything in that sense. Um, and I said, well, it's, it's really reproducible, and people like that. But what I didn't appreciate is what the reproducibility allowed you, which was people always wanted to do quantitative Western blots. And when we came out with our technology, there was people at the Broad Institute in, in, in Cambridge that were, they would like send you the gold standard. You say, I want to do a quantitative Western blot. They would send you something that they had very accurately measured, and you would spike that into your sample and run it and measure it and, and do relational type analyses. Um, the problem with that is that the thing I learned from all this is, and this is something that's hard to admit, but we all have to admit this, the biggest source of error with all these things, the biggest variable, the biggest thing that makes your data super fuzzy, that makes the answers really hard to find most of the time, is us. And so with a traditional Western bot, you're doing 20 or 30 steps, all hand done, and even if two of us stood side, if David Hirschberg and I stood side by side, used the same equipment, the same samples and everything, we'd still have a 20% CV between the two of us because we're all slightly different. And don't get me started on whether you transfer for an hour at lunchtime, whether it's an hour lunch, maybe an hour and 15 minute lunch or a 45 minute lunch, or you're lazy and you say, I'm just gonna transfer in the cold room overnight by lowering the temperature. Everybody does it differently. And so, but as scientists, we think, oh, we see a Western blot in a publication. This is all, it's all the same. It's not all the same. There's huge variation that I've seen. So this ability to be quantitative, the thing, quantitative is meaningless. If I tell you that the number is 10, at first we think, oh great, it's 10. But the real question then is plus or minus what? If it's 10 plus or minus 100, that 10 means nothing. If it's 10 plus or minus 0 0.0001, that's a good 10. And so anybody can be quantitative what you need to have is the quantitation and the reproducibility of the tight CVs to be truly analytical. And so now this technology is like a similar technology, but that doesn't give you the same amount of information that an ELISA, where an ELISA is kind of an immunoassay too, where you would build a standard curve, you would put a known amount of that molecule into some other samples, and here we have known amounts, and then we have our three patients, and we can then have the software do the analysis for us and tell us that, yes, in these patients, there's 21 picograms of this oncogene that's important. So you can start collecting data like that in mass data sets and start feeding those into all the uh, sophisticated software algorithms. I'm done with time, but I have about another five minutes, which is a real kicker. Is anybody okay?
five more minutes, Good. not two more. Okay, because this is the real, this is the epiphany for me. In the field of observation, chance favors the prepared mind, Louis Pasteur. Um, my, my most, I mean, my wedding was scary. There's lots of things in my life that have been scary, but the, the scariest moments I had was the PhD defense. And um, I started, like Rain offers opportunities to students and youngsters and, and college kids and, and grad, you know, you, you have a good cross section. I actually started at MD Anderson as kind of a senior in high school and then all through my college years I would volunteer in the summer. And so that, that's where the seeds get planted and that's where the, the, the passion for it comes from. And so I'm glad you're doing that. So the woman who got me into that summer program, uh, she's actually a very famous immuno-oncologist and everything now. Um, she went through, because I liked her, because she was so nice to me, I put her on all my committees, she went all the way through me, eight years of graduate school, and in my defense, all the people that I thought were going to ask me tough questions, asked me, you know, softball questions, we just want to get you out of here, you've been here eight years, it's only supposed to take six or seven, uh, get a job, get out of here, and she came up to me and she said, because I told you I developed this model of this apoptosis, and she said, and to make that model, I had to grow the cells in culture. And she said, David, what if growing cells in culture makes them irrelevant to studying biology? Because if you think about it, and most people don't, I mean, we all were trained how to do tissue culture, and we talk about the models, we all do this, but it was like, at that moment, the light bulb went on, the brilliance of her question, which was, oh yeah, if you grow them in culture, you're actually making the cells grow on plastic, and you're artificially putting all these chemicals in there to make them grow. You're, by actually growing them in culture, you're asking evolutionarily that you select out only the cells that grow. What about the cells that die? Like, I'm studying apoptosis of cells that die. So by definition, I'm actually selecting against the thing I want to study. Um, and the thing I realized was that she was right, that maybe this whole eight years of work was actually studying an artifact. And I quickly, have you ever been so nervous that you actually feel the metal in your mouth as the blood cells lice and your, and this, the, the the cortisol courses through your veins. It's right before you're about to pass out. And I caught myself and said, mitosis, because in the field of apoptosis, we actually named it apoptosis cell death as kind of a, in, using the Greek to oppose mitosis, which is division. And so I said, well, mitosis, cell division, that's studied in culture. All of it, all we know is all from in culture and everything. And so fundamentally, yes, you may be right that the nuanced things we won't be able to measure in culture, but we can, so anyway, as soon as I could forget that, I forgot it and erased it from my memory that I should question anything I wasn't expecting to see. And so this is, this is, so, this is the nuts and bolts of some of the real raw data and how cool this technology could be. What I showed you before is the traditional type Western blot. We separate by size. We look at the different molecular weights of protein. That's how we identify it. So you hear P53. What does the P53 mean? It means that's the weight of the protein, 53 kilodaltons. Uh, for those of you who have done Western blots, ask yourself this. I won't ask you, but... Why do you separate by size? And the answer for the most part is because that's how my boss taught me how to do it. Um, and then ask yourself a question, is that actually a good reason for separating by size? And the answer to that usually is no. But that's the way everybody does it, so that's the way I do it. And um, I've talked to the guys who actually invented the Western Blot. They were consultants for us in the early days of the company, and they said, yeah, it kind of pissed us off that everybody does it by size because we did it by a bunch of different ways in the original paper. We did it by uh, hydrophobicity, we separated by charge, we separated by all these different dimensions, many of them bio, biologically relevant, but the only one that stuck in, in the community was that everybody separated by size, and so historically that's what everybody does, and we're not happy about that. So with your ideas, you have to be able to let your ideas go. I've seen people do stuff with my technology, the technology that I think is my technology is not, and it frustrates me, but once you put it out there, people are going to do stuff with it, so be prepared with that. People separate by size because in the early days of antibodies, they really were terrible. And so even though you thought an antibody should only recognize your protein, it might recognize 20 bands. And the question was, which of those bands was your protein? And the only thing you could predict reliably was because you, could, you knew the weight of an amino acid. You could add up all the weights of all the amino acids. And you could add up the weight of what the molecule should be. 53 is the supposed weight of P53, and when you separate it, for the most part, it shows up right around 53. And for most proteins, they show up around 
what their weight is. And so in the old days when antibodies really were crappy, even though we all bitch about them nowadays, but nowadays they're actually way better than they were back then, um, the only way to predictably know what your band was was separating by size. So that's why it got started, but that's not a good reason that we all do it now. And one of the things we did with our technology was we had you able to separate in other dimensions. And so one of the dimensions we separated in is charge. So I've mentioned kinases a couple times. And the cool thing about kinases is that they, what they do is they phosphorylate a protein. They kind of flip the light switch. They turn the protein on. And by adding that phosphate, they add a positive charge. And what happens when a protein gets phosphorylated, it, if you separate it in an IF gradient, a pH gradient, so this is acidic, this is basic. If a protein gets phosphorylated, it becomes more acidic. And so what I'm showing you here, this is a very well, what we thought was well understood. This is one of the original Hallmark textbook protein kinases, ERK. And it's called ERK1 and ERK2. There's two forms of it, P42 and P44. What's the molecular weight? 42 and 44. Does the molecular weight change when they get phosphorylated? Eh, some people argue it changes a little bit, but that's all BS. They don't, it doesn't change. But um, let's watch what happens when we treat it with in an acidic uh, separ or an IEF separation, and we look for that addition of the phosphate that should make it become more acidic. So this is this is a great book and movie on Netflix. If you've the Helen Lane's uh, Helen Lane, Hela. Hela. Hela are the cells, but it's they've actually Oprah did a movie. It's on Netflix right now about the lady that these are done on, and it has really good ethical questions about. What do you do with biotherapeutic information? Because uh, her family got nothing out of all this, and her cells are the fundamental foundation of cell culture. Um, HeLa cells. So these are HeLa cells. This is that P42, P44, uh, ERK1 and ERK2. We know it is that because we've uh, separated the proteins. There's, there's thousands of proteins in here, but we've used an antibody to ERK, and it lights up both of these peaks, the 42 and the 44. And uh, these are in what we call quiescent cells. So these are cells that where you really get them quiet so that they don't want to divide. They don't do anything. You syrup, we do serum starving, we pull everything out so they won't be activated. And then the next morning we wake up real loud and we activate them. And what we do is we use a molecule called EGF, epidermal growth factor. And that is like slamming the gas on the, these things and the cells take off. And so watch what happens when we add EGF. So this is, this is, at time zero, when everything's real quiet, we'll add the EGF, wait five minutes, and we'll look at the daughter plate, the, the plate that gets treated with EGF. And it's pretty obvious what happens. We went from these peaks, this is called peakology. These peaks are now peaks over here. And so what do we know from the molecular biology of this? We know that the protein gets phosphorylated. Um, ERK particularly, we know the, the site where the phosphorylations happen. Uh, I'm a Longhorn, went to UT as an undergrad, and so it's fortunate that I studied ERK because it's a T, a 3D, PY, TEY site, uh, the tyrosine over here. And what happens is the first site's phosphorylation rapidly leads to the second site's phosphorylation. So it doesn't matter which one gets phosphorylated first, they either are unphosphorylated or they rapidly are both phosphorylated. And if you look here, you can actually watch this happening because at time zero, I have these all labeled. You would never know what they were at time zero if that's the only data you had. But let's just look at ERK2. So ERK2, this is ERK2 non-phosphorylated. That's ERK2 with a single phosphorylation. And ERK2 with a double phosphorylation is out here. That's why we call it PP double phosphorylation. Same thing with ERK1. And these mobility shifts are, are uh, can be computed, and they're consistent with adding phosphates. And so you add the, you add the drug, you kick on the signaling pathway. And you see the non-phosphorylated forms of the molecule go away. You see the monophosphorylated forms, the T or the, any one of the sites, they don't accumulate. They're the same size. Because from what we read in the textbook, the first site rapidly leads to the second site's phosphorylation. So they, these are transitory states, because they then go to the diphosphorylated phosphate. You notice they don't move any further down. So what, after these sites get phosphorylated, there's no <coughs> phosphorylation. We'll get it, we'll get it afterwards. Um, there's something here that uh, for people that do cell signal is, is huge, which is they always want to know to what degree is my molecule phosphorylated, and probably more importantly if you're a drug company, to what degree am I inhibiting that phosphorylation, or how much am I turning the signal off? And so um, 
with this, you can't do it with a traditional Western block, but with this approach, notice one thing as we go from zero to full on gas, look at the area under those peaks. If you sum all the area up in that five minutes, the area doesn't change. So that tells you that in five minutes, the amount of the molecule, the amount of the protein doesn't change, but it goes from being an inactive quiet form to being a fully active, doubly phosphorylated form, phosphorylating all these downstream signals and causing all these terrible things. And because we can account for all the molecules, we can divide the diphospho peaks by the total area, and we can quantitate the degree of phosphorylation. So this is like a big deal for people that are studying uh, kinase phosphorylation. Okay, so I'm about to do the aha moment. That was cool, but it's not the aha moment. That was cool, that was great proof of concept. That's like what got us the next five to ten million dollars. It was actually these figures. I did a bunch of them. I went to, I got all the cell lines I ever worked with in graduate school. Again, cell lines. This is going to come back to haunt me, the cell lines, because they maybe are irrelevant, according to that lady. Um, Hila, we just went through that. We look at LINCAP cells. These are prostate cancer cell lines. Same thing, times zero. You hit them with a, a different drug, PMA, and they all get phosphorylated within five minutes, 20, uh, 30 minutes, same thing. HD29, liver cancer, same thing. It's all just like you would see in the textbooks. And in fact, there are companies, we're an antibody company, we're companies that have raised antibodies to the diphospho form. They get the peptide, that TEY sequence, and they inject that into bunnies. Bunnies make antibodies to that phosphorylated TEY site, and they sell that as a phospho antibody, a phospho. And so that's the simple way of determining whether it's activated. It's actually the wrong way now that we figured out. But at the time, people were buying hundreds of thousands and millions of dollars worth of this stuff, thinking they were looking at what they thought they were looking at. And so the cool thing about this technology with the small capillaries is that we could, the traditional Western blot was somewhere in this range of, you needed to have tens of thousands, if not hundreds of thousands of cells because of the size of everything you're working with. In the capillaries, you can put uh, 10 to 20 nanoliters of your sample. And so it's a big boon for drug companies that are paying you know, $10,000 for cerebral spinal fluid to do studies on. And, they want to use as little as possible for all these screens. And so we could work with very small samples. We, in some cases, we could actually do a Western blot on a single cell, although in the paper we said it was 25. Um, and one of the things that we got really interested in, because translational medicine was becoming popular in 2005 or six when we did this, was uh, we'd love to do this in the clinic in real patients. We measure this as kind of biomarkers, biomarkers, personalized medicine. That was all starting to. Everything goes through cycles, but the cycle is starting to come back again. And so we found we went out looking for a sucker. And lo and behold, I had some friends that were still at Stanford. And this is you probably don't recognize him because his hair is a lot less gray here. But there's David. This is David Quasi boss or collaborator, partner Dean Felcher. He's a old professor at Stanford. Alice Van in the back is now old professor. All these are friends of ours now. This was our instrument number one, sold for half a million dollars. We were told that um, if you wanted to sell something expensive to the Japanese, it had to be a big instrument. And so, this is actually all breadboard prototype. It was huge. My wife said it looked like a garbage uh, trash bin that you'd find behind an apartment. Uh, but David and Dean and a couple other people all chipped together. We bought one at half a million dollars. And we did our first experiment on clinical samples. And so, this is kind of profound. This is deep. Uh, you have a friend down south a little bit, uh, Brian Drucker, who, who runs a, a shoe company cancer center down there. And um, he's, he's actually an awesome guy. And he's famous because he developed this drug, one of these first targeted therapeutics. It's called Gleevec for Novartis. And Gleevec is a drug that uh, is used to treat CML, a chronic myelogenous leukemia. And it's a kinase inhibitor. So we've talked about these kinases and drugs that can block them. And so people that have CML have this certain translocation that causes a certain kinase to be hyperactivated. And with this molecule, Brian was able to show that he could specifically target this molecule and knock it off. And these patients could go from being deathly sick to in a couple months be completely healthy and have no side effects. So I drove up here from uh, Portland where we visited my wife's uh, aunt and her uncle. And her uncle has CLL. And he had given up about midsummer this summer. He had, he had, he had gone away with conventional therapy. 
uh, he went into remission, and then he come back, and he's like, you know what, I'm done. But just like Gleevec is used to try treat CML, we now have second and third generations for CLL, and he just went on one of these, and we saw him two days ago, and he's uh, working construction in their basement, refinishing their basement and everything. So these are really can be miracle drugs. So one of the things with them, and they're kind of oversold a little bit, because they're called miracle drugs, they get on the cover of Time magazine, and everybody's like, oh, I got CLL, I want this drug. And nobody has the question of, well, will I personally benefit from it? I know there's people here that are thinking of, or that are in the process of starting companies, these personalized medicine companies. And so what we all want to do is use these drugs most efficiently. Some of them, like the one for my uncle, it's $100,000 a year for the drug. And so would you want to take that drug if, a priori, if I could tell you the drug isn't going to do anything for you. Actually, it's the second generation drug or the third generation drug that's the right drug for you because I can tell you before you even start taking it which one's the right one for you. You would want to know that. And so we stumbled into this because all we were trying to do is prove that our technology could be used on clinical samples. And so what we have up top is a woman that presented in the ER in blast crisis. And so this woman was extremely sick and Alice Fan, who was in that picture with David, she's a clinician at Stanford, a hemonc doctor, and she drew a sample from this woman. And we were gonna look at a dozen different uh, onco-related uh, uh, proteins, BCL2, MYC, anybody who knows any of these things, these are like the, the ones that you would go to to look at if you were looking at lymphoma and leukemia, it would be these things. We threw ERK in there because, well, that was the assay I developed, the first assay on the instrument. It was the only one I knew that worked really well. And so it went on there too in the original eight experiments. And so we went through and we, Alice went and collected uh, 20, 30 patients in the first round. And this is the woman when she presents in brass, blast crisis. This is that same woman two weeks after the initiation of, two weeks after the ER, after the initiation of Gleevec, but before she starts showing any clinical response. And she's still very sick. She's just started taking the drug. They have no idea what's gonna to happen to her. And then Alice followed these patients and we had the complete, you know, whether they're complete remission, partial remission, or the disease got worse during their time of therapy. And cancer, one of the things is you don't want to be taking the therapy if your disease is growing during therapy. You want to move to a different therapy and try to stop it. And you want to know that soon. You don't want to go six months and then come back in and say, all right, now take another CT scan, see if that worked. You want to know in real time or before real time. So we looked at all these molecules and David and I are great at making up bullshit stories and we were like, oh, well, this, this one's probably important and this one's probably important. And you know what? David, you, David Boringer, you told me, David Hirschberg, that this is an analytical system, so let's just digitize all this data. And there's a lot of eggheads over at the uh, mathematics department at Stanford. We'll let them analyze it all and tell us what they think is important. And so we did that, and we fed all the data over to them, and they came back, and by the way, the blue box wasn't drawn at the beginning of the slide, at the beginning of looking at this data. They came back and they said, yeah, those other ones that you guys think are really interesting are kind of interesting, there's some relationship, but it's not all that great. Whatever this peak is, the peak that's there and then it disappears here at two weeks, that has like 1.0 correlation with your responders. This woman had an incredible response, disease-free, very quickly. And they were like, what is that peak? And we, we knew from what, what I've shown you, you know, the ERK2, it gets one phosphate added to it, it moves here, it gets a second phosphate, it adds there. We knew it was a single phosphorylation of ERK, but wait a minute, that, I told you, it's a Longhorn TEY motif, it's diphosphorylation, all these companies have developed antibodies to that site. That's the site, if you do phospho flow, ELISA, all these techniques, and you want to study phospho ERK, you study that site. This kind of doesn't fit that model because it's a single phosphorylation and it's sitting there, it's stable, it's not going on to a double phosphorylation. What is going on? And David and I are a little slow. He won't admit it. I'm from Texas and I'll admit that I'm slow. Um, it took us a while and we thought on it and we realized what was happening was that because we had looked at ERK, Alice had done phospho flow and this is another technique that got developed around us. We had looked at it by phospho flow, there's no, nothing interesting there. And the reason why, there's that TEY site. And with fossil flow or all these other techniques, you can measure how much of the protein is there. And then you buy an antibody that is specifically to that phosphorylation site. And you ask, is it phosphorylated or not? And, you know, 
99.9% of the people who are doing fossil work were doing it this way. And if you're studying cells in culture, it works great. But we were studying cells in clinical samples. We were studying actually real material. And what if, in real material, that biochemistry that was happening in culture, that kind of bastardization of whatever Franken stuff we had growing in culture, in reality, in clinical material, the modifications of the proteins were different or discrete to that pathology, that type of uh, uh, um, uh, disease state. And in fact, we wrote this all up. We kind of made this into the argument. We sent the paper in. Uh, Nature Medicine told us, well, there's actually a German group. There's another way to do this. You need something called 2D gel electrophoresis, where you separate it out in multiple dimensions and you start mapping all these spots. And they were looking at a totally different disease, cardiac hypertrophy from clinical samples. And they said, you know, we thought ERK was just that TEY site. Everybody literally thought that was it. And they said, no, no, there's a bunch of other phosphorylation sites. And then subsequently, after the company had took off, we went to Dana-Farber, and there was a group there that was mass spec core. The problem was mass, by mass spec, you couldn't get ERK to fly because of its charge. It, was, it didn't fly real well, so they couldn't. It's a way to do fossil profiling by mass spec. They couldn't do it. It didn't work. These guys at, at MIT or Dana-Farber got it to work, and they're like, there's 20 sites. And so in the time from when we did this paper, where nobody was interested in ERK because it was really just the textbook kinase that everybody got taught and then it went away. It's like one of the hot areas now is map kinase signaling is all the rage again because it's this whole new generation of understanding what we thought we knew was very simple and very simplified. And in my argument is a lot of it's artificial because think about it, these antibodies, these, we, have, we have companies, I'm in an antibody company and I know where our antibodies come from and I know what they've developed against. And a lot of them are developed get against synthetic material, cell lines, that grow in culture. Those are the model systems that are in the textbooks. What if her question at my PhD defense was right in that you do all that work in cell lines, which makes it really easy to do the work because that allows you to do molecular biology really easy. You're not having to do that on patients, which IRP which won't let you do. But what if in clinical material, a lot of the epitopes change, a lot of the post-translational modifications change? Well, then what if the antibodies that you would use aren't even relevant anymore? Because I'll tell you, if you're relying on this antibody to answer your question whether a fossil ERK is signaling, really what you are is you're a horse with blinders on, and you're only looking at that one site saying, you get turn on or not. And these sites over here might be going like crazy saying, yes, we're great biomarkers, but because we don't have anybody to look at that site, these sites, we miss them. And so one of the things I'd leave you with is there's still a lot of work that can be done in antibody research and antibody development. and fine-tuning the tools. Yes, we work with the best we have at the time, but we always have to be asking the question, is this really the best there is? The best that we have at the time versus the best there is are two different things. And too many times we convince ourselves that, oh, this is great because it fulfills my preconceived hypothesis that I wanted to prove. And we had no idea about any of this stuff, and we were blinded to it because we were not expected to see a monophosphorylated earth. In fact, we didn't even see that peak until the biostatisticians came back and said, what is this peak? And we were like, oh yeah. We kind of saw it, but our minds told us it wasn't real, it wasn't supposed to be there, and it was probably artifactual data. Why would we say it's artifactual data? Well, because it didn't fit the model we were expecting to see. So we self-prejudiced ourselves. Um, I'll wrap this up. Um, there was another Nature Medicine paper. These, these guys are real famous. Tom Luft, Lou Stout, this is Dana Farber's cancer biology program, the head of proteomics at, at Pfizer. Uh, Jamie Christensen, George Vanderwood, the guy cloned CMET. These are all big shots. They did the same thing, and they're like, hey, the CMET thing that we're really interested in, that we're drugging all over the place, it's got all these post-translational modifications that we had no idea were there. And so my point is, is that you don't have any of the posters, maybe you do have a couple of these, where we have all these line and stick drawings where we have a node and a signaling pathway and then a line, and a node and a signaling pathway and a line. It's way more complicated than that. There's all kinds of post-translational modifications. And unless you start using the tools that really open your eyes to being able to see them, David and I debated this, is that people see this and they get scared to death because they're, oh my God, that protein that I thought was ERK that had two, it was P42 and P44, my mind thought of it as two molecules because of the two weights. If you turn it on its charge axis, all of a sudden it's seven or eight peaks. A lot of these other proteins, PSA, it's used for prostate cancer. One year it's good, one year it's bad. One year it's good, one year it's bad and they measured the level of PSA. 
Well, but the level of PSA is like, kind of like a PSA as a single entity. If you look at PSA on one of these charge axes, all of a sudden P PSA becomes like 50 different peaks because it has all these different post-translational modifications. Maybe the right test is not to be studying the overall level, but finding that one peak, which is the isoform, which isoform means like a, 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 is of the base form, but it's got a unique modification. If that isoform is going up and down like crazy, if you lump that back in with the total, you're not gonna see it because the, the total is here and there's one peak going like crazy, but it's hidden by all the other peaks. If you break them apart and you can look at it specifically, then you make the amino reagent specifically to that and then you have a pianistic assay that actually works. And that's kind of what we pitch with this technology. Uh, just to wrap this up, this is where I was in life at that point. I was jet setting around the globe, not my own jet. The bag of money I had was not really that big, and I was not Roger Federer, although I did play high school tennis and was ranked in the state of Texas. Um, this is what I realized I was giving up. So there's always sacrifices. And uh, when we were in this phase of the company, when, when the CEO came to me and said, David, you're not a scientist, you're a salesperson. We need you to go on the road because this is real technical stuff. You need to go talk to all these people and explain this to them. And I said, sure, I'll do it. And I started getting on planes three times a week and would be on in the traveling and come home Saturday, sometimes fly out Sunday night and could walk onto the plane at United at SFO and like have the door shut behind me because I had like it timed out so perfectly. And, and always the first class, I, I thought being upgraded to first class was like a status symbol until I started crying in first class. And I realized, what the hell am I doing? This is not a goal. <laughs> First class? Yeah, I can cook food better than this. And my, my furniture at home is a lot more comfortable. So what I was giving up was I was giving up my family. And this is my son, Max. He's got his infant sciences thing from Stanford University. He's adorable. He's my life. Along with Kelly, my wife, she's my, my life too. There's Max in his long horn uniform. And the way I was interacting with him, and this is a little risque, and I knew Max was going to come to the talk, and then he decided not to, and I was like, thank God. He's 13 now. He probably would like not talk to me for another couple of years. <laughs> but this is how Max and I communicated back in the day. This is technology uh, based on, you kind of see by the thickness of the laptop and know what year it was. This is uh, generation one of FaceTime, and Max is always into technology. That is a laser rangefinder that he somehow rewired to work as a telephone. And that's how he would communicate with me. And one of those days, I mean, uh, through all my tears and everything, I would read these magazines to pass the time. And, and I saw this picture and lost sales manager, Captain, and I was like, you know, that, that resonates. That's what I feel. And as a kid, I, my parents wouldn't really erase dirt bikes anymore, so I spited them and went out and spent the money anyway, and I bought a Hobie Cat and learned how to sail. Best way to pick up ladies in college is to have a sailboat, I found out. That was a, a smart choice. But I never sailed after college. I saw that and I was like, hey, sailing looks comfortable again. And in fact, I mentioned picking up ladies that the woman there, Kelly, my wife, I picked her up when she was 15 and I was 16, so I wasn't a player or anything, but I picked her up on the Hobie Cat. Um, we got bought by Biotechni. So now Biotechni owns us. We sold for $330 million. This is about after 10 years from our original founding. Um, Biotechni is right now we're the largest SKU manufacturer of antibodies in the world. Uh, R&D originally, I mean, Biotechnology originally comes from R&D Systems, which is a company up in Minneapolis that's been around for a long, long time. It's kind of a gold standard company. And they had the market cornered on really good amino reagents and recombinant proteins, but they want to control the world. And so to control the world, you need to own all the different nodes. And so having the reagents is great, but if you don't own the machines with the reagents you run on, you're losing money. And so they bought us to be the basis for the machines. And so. We base it around the simple Western, the technology I showed you, but then we acquire technology every six to nine months. We, we've now bought a system that does single cell Western blocks. Uh, we uh, bought advanced cell diagnosis, so a diagnostic, so all kinds of really cool technologies. Um, and then those immuno reagents and the machines to run them on are only good if you're running in clinical material and everything, and so now we're in the clinical space. And that's kind of the model to rule the world. Um, I decided, that I needed to decompress a little bit. And this is Max a couple years back. We decided to take sailing lessons because I hadn't sailed since you know I was trying to woo Kelly 
on the Hobie Cat to, you know, riding her bikini on the boat and everything. And I was always the one that got sunburned. She never would get in the bikini. Um, and this is Max uh, bravely navigating San Francisco Bay in one of the training sailboats there. And in the end, we said, you know what? We're out of here. We're not really out of here yet. I said this five years ago, and it's a rolling every, and we're going to leave in three to four years. But we went and bought, uh, and we tell everybody this, we're not quite sure it's true, but this is Millennium Falcon that, uh, it's a 65 foot steel, three masted schooner that we think was built for George Lucas during those bad Star Wars movies when he was trying to hide under a rock and he was just going to sail around the world. Because it was built in central California where sailboats aren't built. And it was built for somebody wealthy in Marin, so it could have been anybody, but he named it Millennium Falcon, so it must have been him. That's at least the story we're sticking with. There's Kelly and Max on it. So, I mean, I think a lot of you guys know this stuff. Uh, industry failures, first job was a bus, some things you have no control over. Technology, a second job was a bus, but I learned that step up and leave. I've been fearful so much of my life, and I didn't even trust in the training I got. MD Anderson Cancer Center is a pretty good cancer center, like number one or number two in the world. But I was self-conscious about what I could bring to the table. And in this moment, I realized, you know what, just speak your mind and get those ideas out there and have these great engineers help you as leaning on others and collaborating with other people. Um, and so that's where we, we really got this off the ground. Don't forget what life's about. Sometimes you have to let go. I've kind of pulled back in my role now, but it's also been very fulfilling. I spend more time with my family. I have new ventures that are you know, spinning up in other areas. Maybe I'll move to Tacoma, or maybe I'll sail to Tacoma and park the boat out here and come visit you guys all the time. Um, so this is more for the, what I was telling the students at MD Anderson, go outside your comfort zone. Prepare yourself to lead. The biggest thing I had to learn to do was how to speak. Not this way. This is informal speaking, and it's kind of probably haphazardly. But the biggest thing I learned was to take a formal, you know, how to give a TED Talk type thing. That if you're starting your company, do that soon because that pays off such dividends in how you can convince people and how you can raise money and get people to back you and be on your side. Um, and then read a lot of there's a lot of uh, I kind of you know all these all self help books are no good but a lot of them are really good Frost and Gazin, Blink, Freakonomics, The Happiness Advantage, um, and think outside the box. The, the the thing that scares me right now, and we, we see this I did this presentation a year ago, but it's come to fruition in that we now have a Chinese scientist that's cloned using CRISPR these children, and you know I read somewhere that well now he's going to be sentenced to death. This is not like little games anymore. This is serious stuff. Not only on the implications of what he's doing, but also on the implications of what it might happen to you if you step out of line and do the wrong thing. Um, so my, my fear is that, that society isn't prepared for the technology that we're about to unleash on them. And with regulators not being scientifically sophisticated and things like that, it's really our jobs to take on those roles in you know, teaching the public, and that's part of you know, what this is, is integrating with the public and everything. But I was talking to the graduate students there about you know, going to government, going to other roles outside of what you think you're gonna cure cancer, and you can have a much bigger impact. And so always keep your eye open about how you can really, really have an impact in, in pushing it forward. And if you do it all right, this is, so I'm on our boat. These are two guys that did it really right. They're going out uh, water skiing on this day. This is their, these are their two ski boats. They have, they have the dozens of boats. This is like one of their mid-sized boats. Um, and this one is Larry Page's ski boat. And that's Sergey Brin's ski boat. That's his commute boat. So the way they all get around Silicon Valley now, because the highway are ridiculous. And your, uh, what is the Embraer helicopters, those are kind of a little too ostentatious to, it's kind of too showy. Um, the way they get around the bay is in fast boats. And so they, he lives outside of Redwood City. They drive down to the marina. They hop in these boats. They do like 70 miles an hour in the boat. You can go from Palo Alto, Stanford, to downtown San Francisco in like 15 minutes in a boat. And uh, uh, Facebook has a boat running out of here. Uh, Larry Ellison's got his boat running out of here. So that's the future of all this. You guys got plenty of water. So we were talking about. We were talking about getting around uh, and the traffic problems around here. You gotta open up the waterways and start moving people around by water. Anyway, I apologize for going long. 
Uh, I hope it was interesting to you guys, and uh, I'm here until David kicks me out uh, to answer any questions that he might have. Yeah. One is, um, you know, this, the science is, I was always intimidated. I always thought, wow, that's way over my head and it's very complicated. Um, you're gonna be capable of doing way more than I've, I've ever done in my life. And a lot of that has to do with believing in yourself and the opportunities that are gonna be presented to you. Um, and, you know, I see this in my son and it amazes me what he learns and I learn things myself. I went out and cut down my own tree. I probably put my life at risk, but. YouTube is amazing. The things you can learn on YouTube, and there are molecular biology programs. There's a, there's a do-it-yourself YouTube guy where he, he shows how to do it the old way, but he does it all the stuff that he finds around his house and everything. And so there's things that the parents can get involved in, and you know, molecular biology, I don't know what the actual books are, we could look later if you wanted, but at, at a very fundamental level, uh, having the kids come up here at some certain points. When I was younger, I had my brothers come work with me. Um, and you know, just doing tissue culture, doing tasks. One thing, have you ever seen Captain Ron? No, never mind. There's a Captain Ron joke about you got to start out as a swab and then you become a matey, and, and, and there's a bottom job. Be prepared to do that, but you'll learn so much along the way. And more importantly for me, the things that was so cool in this whole arc, this is all cool stuff, but it was the stories of the people that you meet along the way and the things you see happen are just. It's amazing and it's so exciting to be a part of it. Yeah. So we can talk informally too. Thank you guys. Thanks everybody.